If you're new, if you're new here to the Packing House, we teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through the entire Bible, and then we start over. Um, we're in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 47 tonight, because last week we were in Jeremiah 46, and next week we'll be in Jeremiah 48. We started in Genesis, and we went through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, all the way through. Now we're here, and we'll keep going until we're done, and then start in Genesis again. On Sunday mornings, we're teaching the New Testament. We're in the Gospel of Luke when I'm teaching. We're in the Gospel of John when Pastor Ed is up looking at Jesus. But that's kind of what we do. So if you're wondering, why, why is this guy talking about Jeremiah 47? <laughs> because that's where we're at. We're in Jeremiah chapter 47. And uh, we saw last week in Jeremiah 46 that we started into a section in Jeremiah's prophecies where he's now speaking to the nations that surround Israel, okay? This is Jeremiah's word to these nations. We saw last week his message in chapter 46 was a message to Egypt, okay? And, and that God was gonna humble Egypt's arrogance. So what God does is he humbles the proud and he lifts up the humble. And I love what James says and in, 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 uh, Peter in the New Testament. They both said the identical thing. They said, they said so humble yourself <laughs> under the mighty hand of God. We don't have to wait to be humbled. That's what I love about what Peter and James said. They said, humble yourself. And then God will just lift you up. You know, but Egypt was so filled with arrogance. They were at this time in history, in world history, they were the world superpower. We understand what that is as Americans. My whole life, my, the land of my birth, the land of my passport, my whole life, we've been the world superpower. Most people in the world can't, fully understand that. We can. Egypt was the world superpower of this day. This is thousands of years before America even existed. Nations rise and nations fall. This is the history of the world. But God spoke, we saw last week, we're going we're gonna to follow up and finish kind of what we were looking at last week and then we'll go into chapter 47 tonight, which is only seven verses long. But God is, he spoke to Egypt through Jeremiah saying, I'm gonna use Babylon. Babylon was ascending at this moment as the new world superpower. And God said, I'm gonna use Babylon to humble you because this is what God does to nations. This is what he does to individuals. He humbles the arrogant and he exalts those who are humble, who humble themselves. Babylon, God just used Babylon, if you've seen, if you followed here in Jeremiah, he just used Babylon as his instrument of discipline on his own chosen people in Judah. Remember, God used Babylon to come in. God even said, Babylon is my servant. <laughs> and he used Babylon kind of like a, I don't know, what do you use to spank your kids? Like a paddle. You know, with my mom used the belt. No, she didn't hurt me or just ruin me. She always kept it right there on the, that little soft spot back here. But God used Babylon to spank Judah, to, to destroy Jerusalem, to, to destroy the temple, and to destroy all the idols that God's people had even set up in the temple. God used Babylon to carry Judah away into a 70-year discipline in Babylon. And now God's word to Egypt is that the Babylonians are gonna defeat you. If you were here last week, they're gonna defeat you in a battle at Karchemish, okay? This was a famous battle that's recorded not only here in the Bible, but it's found also in, in in archaeology, you know, in Turkey, 
there's recordings of this very battle where, the ba- where Babylon just completely humbled Egypt. Secular sources are recording this same battle at Charchemesh. Babylon officially, this is when Babylon officially ascended as the new world ruling superpower and Egypt was humbled just as Jeremiah said was going to happen. And we saw it and we talked about it last week how God is not only working. You know, what, is, what are these last chapters here of Jeremiah where God shifts from talking to his people in Israel to the tribe of Judah. Now he's talking to the nations about what he's doing among the nations. And we talked about it. God, God doesn't just work in Israel. He doesn't just work in the temple. In fact, when Solomon built the temple, God said to Solomon, don't think that I live in that building that you're building with me as if I live in buildings made with hands. I'm, the heavens of the heavens can't contain me much less this little building you're going to build for me. God doesn't just work in churches. He does work in churches. When we gather together in his name, or two or more are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst. He works, he works powerfully in churches where God's people gather. But do you know he's also working wherever he wants to work? He's working, people are walking around Lake Arrowhead right now and God's speaking to their heart. You know, people are down in Hollywood doing stuff, shady stuff maybe, and God's convicting somebody's heart right now. God is not confined to a building. He's, he's the God of all flesh, as he said in Jeremiah 32. He's the God of the whole earth, the God of all flesh, Jeremiah 32, 27. And he says, when he says that, I am the God of all flesh, he says, is anything too hard for me? And the answer is no, Lord. Nothing's too hard for you. Nobody's out of your care. Nobody's out of your sight. Nobody's out of the realm of where you work. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. God is doing more in more people's lives than we realize, not less. God is doing more in more people's lives than we realize, not less, okay? God is showing more mercy than we would show. Do you realize that, that God is more merciful than you? He's more merciful than I am. He's more merciful, not less merciful. And I thank God for that. (laughs) People can be mean, you know? People are limited, people are grumpy. People can be selfish. God is more merciful than man. You know, when David sinned against God, the prophet Nathan came and gave him three choices for his discipline from God. And two of them involved man as the instrument of the discipline and one of them involved direct from God. And David said, give me the one that comes from God because God is merciful. And David knew that man is not, not so much, you know. But God said at the end of chapter 46, okay, he spoke, he spoke to Egypt. I'm going to humble you. You know, your arrogance is out of control. And this is a message to the United States. It's whoever's, in, whoever's the, big, the, big, the big cheese, you know. The big, the big man on campus, <laughs> And that's us for the last 150 years or more. You know, God's saying, watch out. Because pride comes before destruction. And a haughty spirit comes before a fall. Okay, so God said to Egypt, I'm going to humble you. And he did at the Battle of Charchemesh, where Babylon ascended to the world superpower status there. But did you notice at the end of chapter 46, God says in essence there, after I humble your arrogance, I'm going to restore you. Egypt, I'm going to restore you. In chapter 46, 26, he says to Egypt, afterwards you will be inhabited as in the days of old. After the humbling. Isn't that cool? 
God gave that promise to Egypt. After I humble you, you'll be inhabited again as in the days of old. In Isaiah chapter 19, we're gonna go there right now. If you have your Bibles open there, I don't think we have the slides for this, but in Isaiah 19, we find an even more wonderful level of God's mercy. Isaiah 19, 19. Isaiah 19, 19, easy to remember. Jot that down. But God says, in that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. A pillar to the Lord will be at its border and it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord, the Egyptians, because of the oppressors, and he will send them a savior, a mighty one, and he will deliver them. And then the Lord will be known to Egypt. Look here, this gives me goosebumps. Just thinking of God's love for people, for the, he loves the world. God so loves the world. You ever hear that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. Isaiah 19, 21. And they will make sacrifice and offering. Yes, they will make a vow to the Lord and they will perform it. This is the Lord God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who created the heavens and the earth and made man in his image. He's saying, the Egyptians are gonna worship me. And he goes on there in Isaiah 19, verse 22, and it says, and the Lord will strike Egypt. And this is like the discipline of a father. This is like my mom. My mom used to discipline me. My dad would take me back there and she, he would say, when I hit my leg, scream real loud so your mom thinks I disciplined you. <laughs> my dad, <laughs> he was so cool. <laughs> the Lord will strike Egypt and he will strike and heal it. This is all of God's discipline is, for the, is to the end of blessing and healing. And they will return to the Lord and he will be entreated by them and he will heal them. This is speaking about Egypt. Okay, we're here in the church. There's a lot of people out in the world and God's working out there because God loves those people out there. And he goes on there in Isaiah 19. He says, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Okay, Egypt is south of Israel. A highway would have to go right through Israel because Assyria is up in the north there of Israel. There will be a highway and the Assyrian will come into Egypt and the Assyrian and, and, eat, and the Egyptians will serve, serve with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel, check this out, will be one of three. Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people. <laughs> and Assyria, the work of my hands. And Israel, my inheritance. You see where God's heart is? We see all through scripture, we see all through scripture that all of God's promises to Israel are for the world, right? All, all that God is doing and revealing to Israel, it's so that the whole world might come to know God and know the love of God and the salvation of God. It's for the nations, it's for all people, not just people that look like you or kind of like people I can relate to, but all people, including me and you. When God chose Abraham, he was the first of these people, first of the people of Israel. He was the first. He was from northern Iraq, modern day northern Iraq, the Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamia. He, and God called him to come to the land of Canaan and he said, I'm gonna give you a land, I'm gonna give you this land. I'm gonna give you offspring. I'm gonna make your name great, Abraham. This is the one guy named Abraham 4,000 years ago. 
It's the biggest name in the world now. And God said, I'm going to make your name great. And he said, through you, Abraham. Catch this. Because this is what it means to be chosen. It doesn't mean you're in and everybody else by default is out. You're going to heaven and by default everyone else is going to hell. That is not what the Bible is teaching. Okay, and that's a kind of a mentality that comes out of the Reformation 500 years ago. And it's not, God told Abraham, through you all families of the earth will be blessed. This is what it means to be chosen. You're chosen to be near me, to know me, so that you might make me known to the world because I love, I so love the world. I'm gonna give my son for the salvation of the world. This is what it means to be chosen. You're chosen to know God and take God to everybody. Take the love of God, the redemptive love of God to everybody. Nobody is outside of the scope of who God wants to reach. Nobody. In fact, the greater the sin, the greater the grace, and the greater the glory that God gets when he lays hold of that one. That's the way it is. He saves us to the praise of the glory of his grace, you see? So if you're listening to this online, you're here in the house and you're thinking, I'm, I'm way out there, Pastor. You don't know me. You don't know the stuff I've done. You don't know where I've been. Well, the farther out you've been and the worse stuff you've been involved in, the greater glory you'll bring to the grace of God when you let his love win you over. God says Israel, Egypt, Egypt. He says he's, in that day, there will be blessed be Egypt, my people. Israel, Assyria, the work of my hands, Israel, my inheritance. It's so beautiful where, where this is all headed. It's so beautiful what God is doing, what God is doing in the world, okay? God so loves the world, he always has, he still does, and he ever will. Now as we go into chapter 47, Jeremiah brings a prophetic word to the Philistines. The Philistines, okay? Notice here, these are a people who had made themselves perpetual enemies of Israel. They just perpetually, they were just stuck on attacking and seeking to annihilate Israel constantly attacking them, raiding them. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines, and, this, and, and then Jeremiah puts in here, this was before Pharaoh of Egypt attacked Gaza. Okay, what, what is that? Okay, here's the word of the Lord now to the Philistines, and this is before Pharaoh Necho attacked Gaza. What? Well, we know from secular historical records that Pharaoh Necho of Egypt, he went on a campaign in 609 because, follow this, he wanted to prop up Assyria to assist and to gang up on the ascending Babylonian power. Egypt was looking for help and alliances because they could see that Babylon was rising in world dominance. They wanted to you know, maintain this balance of power. And so here's this word to the Philistines, and this is before Pharaoh attacked Gaza, which is where the Philistines lived. You've heard of the Gaza Strip, right? Right there on the sea coast, in the, on the Mediterranean. Okay. So Egypt wanting to extend its position in, in terms of duration as world superpower. They went on this campaign, and on this campaign up to, the, to Syria to build this alliance, they attacked the Philistines. They attacked Gaza. That's simply what we're, we're told in verse one. This prophecy was given before that attack on Gaza, before the Egyptians attacked the Philistines there. 
And so here's the word of the Lord through Jeremiah to these Philistines who had made themselves perpetual enemies to Israel. Thus, they had made themselves enemies to God. They'd made themselves enemies to what God was wanting to do through Israel for the world. When someone attacks a servant of God that God has called, they're attacking the work that God is trying to do through that person, through that people. And God had told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. Because Abraham, you're not about you. This isn't about you. This is about me bringing the knowledge of me to the whole world. So whoever blesses you will be blessed because they're blessing what I'm doing. Whoever curses you, I will curse because they're getting in the way of what I'm trying to do in bringing my salvation to the world. God's serious about that about bringing his salvation to you and you and you and me and you. And so here's, this is why the Philistines, have, they've put themselves in this really bad position. They're attacking what God is doing through the descendants of Abraham. They're constantly raiding. They're wanting to annihilate them. Sound like a common theme in history? <laughs> There's never been a people that have been so attacked, you know, their annihilation so repeatedly sought after than these people. There's never been anything like it. You know, Mark Twain called anti-Semitism the swollen envy of pygmy minds. I think it was more than that. It's a, it's a demonic attack against God bringing his salvation to you and me. It's about you. You realize that? Anti-Semitism is about you. <laughs> because those are the people, and that's the land, and that's the city, Jerusalem, that God has chosen to bring his salvation, to bring his Christ, his, their, their Messiah, our Savior, not only in his first coming, but in his second coming. What is this irrational hatred? You know that Jewish people make up less, they make up about one quarter of 1% of the world's population. Think of how small that is. And yet they're, they're made into the boogeyman and the scapegoat of everything, you know? It, there's a spiritual root to this. There's a demonic root their destruction, it's a satanic desire to destroy the people and the, and the platform upon which Christ will come now in our, from our point of view, here alive in, the, in 2022, in his second coming. When, when Europe drove, when the Europe, Europe was killing all the Jews, six million of them, and driving them all out of their villages, the pogroms, and they all, they all came, most of them, many to America. And then we got all these incredible professors and, you know, microbiologists, and we, and, and we, we got blessed. The meteoric rise of the, you know, biomedical fields, it, 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 you can track it right with the arrival. They drove out all of their big professors and scientists. It's irrational. It's irrational. It's spiritual. And so here these Philistines, they're in this place where they're always seeking to destroy. There's nations today that seek the destruction, you know, I don't think that the president of Iran is listening online right now. But I would say to you, chill out, bro. <laughs> you know? God's chosen these people. I had an interesting encounter when we lived in a town called Sentendre, Hungary, this beautiful town on the Danube River. The guy, this guy owned the nicest house. His, it was like a 500-year-old house built on this old well, and it, 
and it was for sale, so I went over to look at it, not that we could afford it, but it was open house, and this dude was a Hungarian guy that was the head of the nuclear program in Switzerland, and he was home in Hungary, and he heard that we were Americans, and I had lunch with this guy, and he was an anti-Semite his whole life. And he started to explain to me, how can these people call themselves the chosen people? And I said, you know what? They didn't call themselves that. God called Abraham. <laughs> and I shared with them what I shared with you tonight, that God said to Abraham, through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. And this guy who'd been an anti-Semite his whole life, he stood up. We were at this cafe in St. Andre outside, and he grabbed me. He's like, you just changed my life. <laughs> all this hatred and all this bigotry I've had my whole life. I didn't realize that God wanted through them to bless the whole world, including me. He just had this weird view of why these people are the chosen. They're chosen to bring it to us. Like imagine like we're the whole world in this room tonight and we all have a terminal disease. We're all dying and we can't get out of here. I mean, God somehow breaks through the ceiling and he has the cure to our disease and he says, Mike Morley, I'm putting this in your hands and I want you to distribute this, Mike. You're my chosen to give this to every single person in this room. Would you, like, want, would you start a campaign to destroy Mike Morley? Who do you think you are calling yourself? That you, Mike's like going, I, didn't, I, was just, I, I, I was just living my life and God like put this in my hand and he actually wants you to have it, you know? I'm good with it. I'm like, praise God, Mike, buddy, my buddy, Mike. <laughs> Give me some of that, you know? You see, you see what it is? That's what it is. But the Philistines had set themselves perpetually. And so the Lord said, behold, waters rise out of the north. Here, Jeremiah's seeing this. You know the, the word prophet in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew? There's a couple words for prophet, but one of the words is seer, someone who sees. God gives them a spiritual insight into things that are yet coming. Jeremiah was seeing this. He said, behold, these waters are rising out of the north and they shall be an overflowing flood and they shall overflow the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell within. So he sees this picture and they, and they knew of this in those days because the rivers, the Euphrates, you know, the Jordan, the, the Nile down in Egypt, they would there was whole seasons when the rivers would overflow their banks. I've seen it in Budapest. And the whole city stops and everybody fears and everybody's filling up sandbags and watching as the river gets higher and higher because if that water overflows the banks, everybody's in trouble. All the buildings will be flooded. And this has happened before. And then it takes months and months and months of digging out the mud and re repairing all the damage. And so Jeremiah sees this flood. This is the picture coming from the north. This is where Babylon is, in the north. He sees the Babylonian forces coming upon the Philistines. He sees them coming in, in an unstoppable, destructive force, like flood water, so powerful. And he, Jeremiah sees it and he says the men shall cry, the men shall be crying. Here he is speaking here to the, the men in, in the, of the Philistines there. All the inhabitants of the land shall wail at the noise of the stamping hooves of, the, of his strong horses and the rushing of his chariots at the rumbling of his wheels. So he's, he's describing what he's, it's like he's, he's, he's transported into this movie almost. He's watching it happen and he can hear the sounds and the agony of this judgment that's being brought upon the Philistines. The fathers will not look back for their children. The, the, this thing will come so powerfully that you know, just common courage will, will just leave the men. They won't even look back. This, 
natural care for their own children. They'll be so panicked is what he's saying. They, 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 will, they will not look back for their children lacking courage because the day that comes to plunder all the Philistines, to cut off, notice here, to cut off Tyre and Sidon. These are two towns above Israel in Phoenicia. The, these are Phoenician towns. Every helper who remains, the, the, they'll be, the Philistines will be cut off from any assisting foreign help. For the Lord shall plunder the Philistines, the remnant, notice, of the country of Kaftor. Notice there, the country of Kaftor. It's interesting because Kaftor is the origination of where the Philistines came from. And this is a huge topic today. This is a huge topic today over who does the land of Israel belong to. You know, Philistines, Palestine. Here, here it's, the, the, it's, it's, it shows us that the Philistines originated in Kaftor, which is in Crete. They, never, they weren't even indigenous. They weren't even native to that land. They came down and took these coastal towns. But they were a seafaring people that came in. They weren't from there. They weren't from there. And they're not mentioned in all these records, in all these secular records in history when these battles are being mentioned. They're not mentioned after this. Baldness has come upon Gaza. This is the Gaza that we know, the Gaza Strip. Ashkelon is cut off. I've been to Ashkelon. We did an archaeological dig in Ashkelon there, just south of Tel Aviv. So Jeremiah sees the Philistines cutting off, baldness. They're cutting off their hair, their beards. This is a sign of deep grief and sorrow distress from the destruction of this invasion of the Babylonians. Jeremiah is seeing this in advance with the remnant of their valley. How long, Jeremiah, as he's seeing this, he speaks, he says, how long will you cut yourself off? Jeremiah is reacting to what he's seeing. It's interesting. And then notice what Jeremiah does. He cries, as he sees this horrific scene, the prophet of God that's bringing this message of judgment, of destruction on these people that are trying to destroy the people that God is bringing salvation to the world through, he cries out, Jeremiah cries out and says, oh, you sword of the Lord. Because he realizes that the Babylonians are like a sword in the hand of the Lord, that it's the Lord bringing his judgment. How long until you are quiet, Jeremiah says to the sword. <laughs> Put yourself into your scabbard, into your sheath. Rest, be still, stop. This is so interesting to me. Jeremiah the prophet, seeing all this destruction, even on the Philistines, who are the arch enemies of his own people. He sees this destruction prophetically in this vision. And he speaks to the sword that's destroying his enemies. And he says, how long are you going to do this? He's horrified at this. How long will you continue this destruction, O sword? He pleads with the sword. <laughs> he says, put yourself back in your sheath. Stop. He asks the sword. He says, please rest. Be still. What is this? I'll tell you what this is. Jeremiah, like God, like God, as God says in Ezekiel 33, 11, for those of you taking notes, God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, even in God's own enemies. He takes no delight. And so Jeremiah, he's not delighted in this at all, what he's seeing. And he's, he's like going, like any human being, any normal human being that has any humanity still in them. And you know what, as Christians, we should, be, be, we should be becoming more and more humane, not less and less. You know, you got some guys out preaching hell. And, and it's like, 
it's the most horrific thing you could, I don't trust these guys that just preach it like they're just preaching it. You know, if you think about what that is, it's so horrible. But some guys are preaching it as if they, you know, you're all going to hell. You don't even know what, you don't even know what that is. If you can just say it like that, you monster. You can just preach it and jam it down people's throats. You don't even know what you're talking about. Jeremiah knows what he's talking about. He sees what's happening and he's like, how long? Put yourself back in the sheath. Rest, stop. This is normal. This is normal. And there are some who fancy themselves as prophets of God who proclaim a message of judgment from God with a harsh tone, even with anger. Some even delighting even in their message of judgment. They do not speak from the heart of God. They do not speak from the heart of God. God does not delight in judgment. God doesn't gloat over the pain that we bring upon ourselves. He doesn't gloat over the pain that we bring upon ourselves. God delights in mercy. We're told in James 2.13, we even sing that song here. Mercy triumphs over judgment. See, this is God's heart. Jeremiah was a man of mercy. Jeremiah bringing this prophetic word of judgment that's gonna come against the Philistines, even while bringing it, he's pleading with this sword, put, please, put yourself back in. And this is a judgment on people that wanna destroy Jeremiah and Jeremiah's people. But this is the heart of God. This is the heart of God. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Do you recognize that, those words? This is God. While he's being crucified, Jesus, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, this is, this is Jeremiah. He's a human, he's humane. He has the heart of God. He's not some wild-eyed, crazy man, preacher you know, with this harsh and angry tone. Oh, sword of the Lord, how long until you are quiet? Put yourself up into your scabbard, rest and be still. And then the answer to Jeremiah's plea, how can it be quiet? Seeing the Lord has given it charge. How can the sword be? Before the Lord has given it charge against Ashkelon and against these towns of the seashore, there he has appointed it the sword of God's judgment against these folks who are constantly seeking to destroy the people through whom God has promised to bring salvation to the world. God's serious about this. He's gonna, he's gonna preserve these people. You know? He's gonna preserve them. He's gonna spank them and he's gonna preserve them and he's gonna bring, even though they're, they're faithless, even though they're failures, and that's the record of the Old Testament. It's the failure of God's chosen people. That's what we see. And we also, the other thing we see is the faithfulness of God. He's not gonna let them go. He's gonna bring about everything he promised to them, which is for who? The entire world. It's for all of us. And God has a plan for your life. And you've experienced a lot of chastening, a lot of spanking for whom the Lord loves, he chastens, the Bible says. Some of you are like, man, God really loves me. It's just been, all it's been is 30 years of spanking. Yeah, he does love you and he's not gonna let you go. He's not gonna kick you out. He's not gonna be done with you. He's gonna fulfill the purpose for which he laid hold of you because that's how he is. That's how he is. Wow. Wow. Nebuchadnezzar's army, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the armies of Babylon were acting as instrument of God's purposes in bringing Judah into captivity, 70 year discipline back in Babylon. The Babylonian army are also God's instrument here in bringing this destruction on these people who are constantly trying to destroy 
the people that God's bringing salvation through. It's interesting, we'll end with this archaeological note, but this is called the Babylonian prism, a cumiform. This is not, this is a, found in, in, in secular, it's, it's now in Istanbul. In this writing here, they found this, it mentions the presence of the kings of Tyre and Sidon, of Gaza, of Ashdod, at the court of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian invading armies. Okay, this very invasion that in chapter 47 that Jeremiah is seeing, it was recorded in a secular source and it's preserved in a museum. Also, a prison list. This one's a prison list that's in Berlin. It records the rations for the kings of Ashkelon that are mentioned in our chapter here that he was to get in prison, it, what, what the foods that he was to be given when he was taken and imprisoned by the Babylonians that Jeremiah saw would invade. And it's, it's so interesting. God is at work. He's at work all over the world, even today, in ways that for sure we are not aware of. He's at work. I love that. God's doing more than you think. He's working in more people than you can imagine. And he's more merciful than you are. You know what, my, my goal is to, I, I'm like, God, enlarge my heart. That's, you know what, David prayed that, enlarge my heart. Because David realized my heart's not as big as yours, God. And David, David saw the heart of God. He was a man after God's heart. And he was like, I want a heart like yours. So he prayed, enlarge my heart. I want to be, I want, I want my, my mercies to be as wide as your mercies, you know? God is at work. Right now, he's lifting up those that are bowed down. He's, right now, he's working and he's humbling the arrogant. Among, in, he's working among nations. He's working among individuals, among people that don't go to church. He's working. I love this. He's working his will in and through all of the good and bad free will choices of men, of angels, and of nations. That's what it means that God is sovereign. He's working his plan, his beautiful plan, in and through all the good and bad, the good and evil, free will choices of men, fallen angels, and of nations. This is the God we serve. This is the God we serve. He's the sovereign king. You know, for me, and I know it's your desire too, <clears throat> I'm so thankful that we can humble ourselves. So thankful. I can, we can, any, at any moment of the day, you can just stop and go, God, I humble myself before you. I humble myself, Lord. And he'll lift you up. You know? This is what he does. I know that you have the same desire I do. I want to be dialed in to what he's doing. And he's, he's working here. He wants to use you, maybe even tonight, to encourage someone here. But you know, wherever you go tomorrow, he's working there too. And he wants you to be dialed in to what he's doing. I've heard so many stories of your life during the week where God led you to some person and some setup and there was the, God, God wants to use you. He's working out there in the wildest places, in the darkest places, he's working. I want to be dialed in. I want to be available, Lord. Here we are, Lord, use us. You know, someone once said, God doesn't look for ability. He looks for what? Availability. He'll use you. <laughs> he used Balaam's donkey. He uses donkey. You know, people, they come up, Pastor, that was so good. I'm like, yeah, and he also speaks to donkeys. <laughs> through jackasses. Here's another jackass he's, maybe he's working through. I don't know. I don't want to be cursing what God is blessing and, the, and find myself cursed. The object of the sword, you know. I want to be dialed into what he's doing who he's using. I want him to use me. I know you do too. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
We thank you for Jeremiah 47. We bless your name, God. You're the God of all the earth, the God of all flesh. There's nothing too hard for you, Lord. Lord, we pray you change our lives by dialing us in to what you're doing. That we would get our eyes off ourselves. We'd stop caving in like black holes of, in, in our depression. But we would shine bright. We'd shine looking out, seeing what you're doing, being available to you. Lord, this is how we're supposed to live. And we pray that it would be I pray for anyone here that's been just stuck in their own thoughts, in the prison of their own mind, tormented in their own selfishness, that you would capture their attention. Lord, call them out of their selves to follow you. If anyone would follow me, Jesus said, let him deny yourself, take up your cross, and come on, let's go. Turn our eyes outward, Lord, to you and to others. Dial us into what you're doing on Thursday morning, tomorrow morning, that we would see it and be there to be used of you. For your glory and our greater joy, we ask it in Jesus' precious name and everybody who agreed said out loud together. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.